Let me tell you a little bit about Lux Capital. Uh, and there are three things I'll tell you. The rest you can look up online. All of you know how to get more research done than, than even I know. Um, we invest in early stage breakthrough companies, which means we're looking for companies that are founded on the principles of science and engineering. Think of it this way. These are companies that have no business existing without some fundamental change that happened in science and engineering within the last 10 years. Like you could not imagine these companies existing 10 years ago. Put that in your mind. Uh, and, and suddenly innovation starts to, will look different to you. Um, which means for us, it's often companies like SpaceX and Tesla and Nest, rather than companies like Snapchat or Instagram. The second is we invest across the country. You know, we have offices in New York City and Menlo Park. But what I mean by that is that there are innovation hubs, just like Northeastern and Boston, there are innovation hubs across the country where there's incredible research happening and incredible ideas being born every single day. And the third is that we manage very large sums of money, over a billion dollars in capital. Uh, six of us manage that money, uh, which means, a, no, I'm not rich, but, uh, but certainly, you know, I feel a great deal of societal pressure to make sure that this money gets spent in ways that do good for the society, as well as, of course, make money for our, um, for our LPs. This is my team here on, on the scene, um, on the screen that you see. Um, you know, we're very proud of the people that, that we back. These, the, our, our Lux family consists of amazing entrepreneurs um, who every single day try to break the normal laws of physics. Now, I say that sitting in a science and engineering school, but this is really important. You know, most of these companies are at the edge of where the normal laws of physics apply. And, and in doing so, they're bringing true innovation to life. Now, whether that's curing horrible diseases, um, you know, sending satellites into space, you will hear more about that. Um, you know, uh, using cutting edge machine learning, AI type techniques to do drug discovery all the way to doing your taxes faster. Uh, but the idea is, that uh, these guys are imagining worlds that are very different than the ones we exist in today. And the only difference between them and most of us is that they commit their lives to making it happen, making it real. Uh, I am hopeful that many of these companies, we've invested in over 90 companies, will grow up to be billion dollar companies um, and, and hopefully make a lot of money for all the people involved. But, but there's one thing that's very common across all of them. On the screen, you see companies that are in every sector. They're literally construction companies. They're robotics companies, satellite companies, drone companies, virtual reality companies, artificial intelligence company, drug diagnostics companies, uh, prescription pharmaceutical companies. There's one thing very common in them. Every single one of them, whether they're successful eventually or not, one thing is clear, that entrepreneurs want to change the status quo. They want to change the world. So let me talk today about change, about change makers, and connecting all of this is this word, rebels. To be a change maker, you have to be a rebel. Uh, these are the kinds of people that sort of we tend to uh, fall in love with. You know, let's start with the history of our future. And uh, the history of our future is really a history of subterfuge and uprising, right? This is because the future is ushered in not by those who are protecting the past, but by those who are seeking to uprise, overturn, break through, right? Even as I say these words, they invoke kinetic visuals, if you think about them, right? A violent and volatile change from the status quo uh, that exists today. And by definition, change is news, and news is change, right? Headlines don't read, oh, yesterday, just the same as the day before, tomorrow will be the same. That's not reality. Military actions are changed, right? Elections are changed, and we're dealing with some of the consequences now. Uh, market moves are changed, currency moves are changed, inventions are changed, hirings and firings are changed. Change is all around us. So the more the change, the more the surprise, which is actually really not ought to be that surprising because what is really truly constant is the fact that there will always be change, right? That is flux. We actually jokingly at, at Lux call it flux, the function of flux. And that is actually not just a funny symbol. It really, for all of our team, it, it really embodies the fact that the idea that change is always just around the corner and for us to discover is truly embedded in everything we do. There is no liking at Lux Capital 
for constant for constancy and and uh, and stability. Um, but here's something that we may all have noticed, you know, in in this world that's changing fast, the rate of change itself seems to have quickened as well, right? If you were in school, when Shashi and I were in school, things didn't change that fast. These days, before I get to figure out which is the coolest app my kid is using, and I download it and start using it six months later, it's not cool anymore. People have moved on, the kids have moved on, oh, the parents came to that website, uh, or that app, okay? Um, why is that rate uh, picked up, the rate of change? Well, is it because our tools today can make more tools? Is that, is that the reason? And you know, I'm not just talking about 3D printing, which of course is important, right? Because you can print tools that make themselves. They can printer that can be made by its own self, right? Uh, and by the way, 3D printing is is a is an area that Boston is a leader in. From desktop metal, which is actually one of the Northeastern University students is working there, to Onshare, Form Labs, and others, Boston is the real hub of that. But uh, but I'm talking about something different. So if you ask an anthropologist. Um, what is it that makes humans the dominant species? Uh, you might hear that it's because we're tool makers. And I actually think that there's nothing really special about that, even though you might hear that. Um, there's nothing special about species with tools. You know, birds build nests, right? They use tools to do that. Uh, beavers build dams, and chimps use sticks to dig for food. So what is it that's special about it? For most of humanity, we have made the same tools our ancestors have used, but we never got that much better than them. Uh, so what changed? Well, I think what changed is that we figured out science. We figured out, we discovered how to discover new things, how they work, and why they work. We were able to explain phenomena, not just use them. Okay? Today, almost all new things that we know of come from science-based inventions. You know, look around you for the wonderment of everything around you, right? From screens, computers, phone antennas, this mug, this screen, this microphone, rubber soles, alarms, your shoes, your watches. Everything was invented over the last 50 to 100 years, right? And everything was invented because there was some scientific innovation that allowed that to happen. Most of you are probably carrying an iPhone or an Android device, right? That touch screen was not possible when the two of us probably bought our first cell phone. That technology, that science did not exist. Okay? Uh, but celebrating how inventive our species is misses the mark. It isn't that mankind is great. I'm not up here to give you an anthropology speech that man, humankind is amazing and special. My point is that mankind is not great, but it is the rebels and the mavericks amongst us who push mankind forward. It's a few, but it's very powerful ones. You know, they're the ones who expand the spotlight of what is known today. They're curious and courageous to take risk and reach into the darkness and the unknown. And yet, the majority of the people, the majority of the time, are against change, right? Nearly every one of our inventors, and I said we have 90 plus portfolio companies today spread across this country and some are outside of this country too. Every single one of the inventors will tell you stories of being laughed at, ridiculed, rejected, ostracized, or ignored, okay? So of course, the people we celebrate for their breakthrough ideas, you know, may have been smart, creative, or lucky, but most importantly, right, so no matter what their, what their particular circumstances were that led them to that invention, most importantly, they were brave and unrelenting, and they were courageous. They were full of persistence, right, and perseverance and tenacity. They were unwilling, to fold in the face of wrathful majority. Keep that thought in mind. Now, we say we like change, but actually we lie. We don't, right? Most of us don't actually like change. Think of your own lives, right? We may think we do. We may even say we do like change, but it's not true. We form habits, right? We like predictability and we dislike surprises. We hate shocks. Uh, in fact, every single day, our routine is very simple, right? If I wake up in the morning and my restroom is occupied, I get upset because I have 15 minutes to get ready and get out of it or I'll miss a meeting, right? Um, so we all think, and these are, by the way, great entrepreneurs, some you will recognize and some you will recognize in, in, in the future. We all may be individualistic, but as history shows, in mass, people are conforming and predictable, right? Most of us seek approval. 
Most of us need security and reassurance. We dislike dissenters, okay? There's a reason why many of you are wearing suits and ties today, right? This is probably not how you dress every day. Maybe Shashi does, but most of you don't, okay? <laughs> but you tried to fit in, okay? Um, it is not a surprise that contrarians, which are inventors and entrepreneurs, are always a minority. That's by definition, right? They realize it's a redundant waste of their time to express a majority opinion, since by definition, there are plenty of others doing that and they don't need to. All of these people, you have running culture here in Boston, you have a bicycling culture in California. When I first went there, I bought a bike, it was probably a $200 bike I bought at Walmart, and all my friends are like, you have to buy a bike like that and you have to wear clothes like that. I said, why? Because then you look like an idiot going down the street. I said, well, I'm just biking for half an hour, 45 minutes a day. But there's a lot of intense societal pressure to fit in. But we all know the stories of the persecution of Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler. And we shake our heads in disbelief when we hear about them, right? It's easy from where we stand today to say, oh my God, these guys were treated so badly. But the reality is that it is very likely that if we were around back then, we may have been a part of the very same crew that treated them badly. You know, we may have been attacking the very people that we today hold in very high regard. So consider more uh, modern examples that I'll give you. Right? People who were ridiculed either by others in their own fraternity, so others in their own field, or by those who argued that how can somebody outside of their field know anything about their field? So here's an example, Hermann von Helmholtz, right? Many of you must have heard of his name before. He was a physiology professor, right? So in the 1800s, he proposed the theory of the conservation of energy. Many of you may have heard about it, like energy cannot be destroyed or created. When he came up with that idea, physicists would not believe him. They, had, they paid him no attention because who was he, a physiology professor, talking about physics, right? In Vienna, in the mid-1800s, large numbers of women and babies died during childbirth. So there was this guy, Ignaz Semmelweis. Right? He was a physician who had a big idea that changed the world for those people. Uh, it challenged 2,000 years of medical dogma and was utterly ridiculed, by the way, by his community. And his license was taken away, the medical license to perform. He was ostracized uh, and ridiculed. Um, his crime? His crime was identifying that doctors were more likely to lead to child deaths than midwives because, because they did not wash their hands after working with cadavers. That simple, right? What happened to him when he came up with that and saved so many lives? Just wash your damn hands before you go work on, 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 a, on a pregnancy and birth. Um, he would die penniless in an insane asylum beaten to death by guards because he challenged physicians, okay? Now, 20 years later, Louis Pasteur, a chemist, motivated by losing three of his five kids to infectious disease, developed the germ theory of disease, okay? And he was himself met with violent resistance from physicians who refused to pay any attention to him. Hey, what does he know about human bodies? And then there were these two brothers with no scientific training or schooling beyond high school, Right, who opened a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. And they were ridiculed for their attempt at flying. When serious and well-funded engineering efforts were already underway, and these guys were basically high school students who were doing this. Well, now it's history, and we all understand that the Wright brothers treated flying like balancing on a bicycle. And that allowed them to fly. It was a very simple idea. But these were not the engineering powerhouses that were supposed to answer that problem, and hence, they were not accepted worldwide. Well, here's another one. You know, this poor woman named Maria Sklodowska, she was born to a Polish family in Russian-occupied Poland. She was a fighter, a resistance, a resistor, a rebel. She excelled in math and science, but in Russia-occupied Poland, she was not allowed to go to school. Right? So too poor to travel abroad, she kept working. At the age of 24, she finally found some money to be able to go to Paris, where she would get to study with some smart scientists. One of them was called Pierre Curie. Later on, she became known Marie Curie, and she discovered radioactivity. She published papers, but was completely ignored. Later, the French Academy of Sciences rejected her application for membership. Harvard, that little school just down the road, um, 
refused to award her an honorary degree. You know, they claim that she did not deserve the credit because her husband had helped her. But then, of course, we know the history. Later on, she went on to win not one, but two Nobel Prizes. Unbelievable how she was treated in her own life. Judah Folkman, another local guy, made the huge discovery that tumors grew their own blood vessels. That was such a crazy idea back then that his own colleagues told him, back off, buddy, you're wasting your time. They rejected him. People walked out of his lectures. You know, researchers were told not to join his lab. His funding was cut. And board members at Children's Hospital in Boston were told, uh, uh, told their peers that this might be a reputation risk for Harvard University. And this was, by the way, a place that yielded many, many Nobel Prizes. They should have known. But they punished him. They cut his salary in half. Okay? They forced him to quit surgery and forbid him from operations. For a decade, he was mocked. Well, today, nearly half the medicine that's prescribed for cancer patients are based on that very same idea that if you can starve tumors of blood, they will die. Now the hospital is, of course, today, you know, Children's Hospital is very uh, proud of their affiliation with him. But they acted the way most institutions do. He acted differently. He persisted. Well, inventors, engineers, scientists, just like athletes, are motivated by curiosity, competition, vanity. Right? But it isn't all virtue. We don't all just do it for the science of it. We don't just do it for the glorification of humanity. It isn't enough for us to invent or discover something and savor it and keep it secret. Okay? We want to, we're eager to go up to the rooftops and shout out from the rooftops and mountaintops. We want to win praises and accolades, right? We want to get awards and riches and recognition and immortality through fame. No, we're all human being at the end of it, regardless of, of our achievements in life. Many of us want to triumph over peers with competitive one-upsmanship. Um, one the neuroscientist Stuart Feinstein was, uh, says, one of the more gratifying, if slightly indulgent pleasures of actually doing science is proving somebody, somebody wrong, and especially people who disagree with you. Max Planck, must have heard that name, the famous physicist, was once asked, how often does science change? You know what his answer was? With every funeral. Change is not easy. Sometimes people never accept change until they die. Dogma rules their life. But rebels and punks don't give up their dreams. They don't stop thinking differently regardless of the opposition they face. That desire to think differently, more than technology or the patents that they may be granted, is the very thing that we invest in at Lux Capital. Our technical and scientific founders and inventors and entrepreneurs uh, don't have to worry about people stealing their ideas, frankly. And I know you hear a lot about them. That is not their primary concern. In fact, they have to worry more about jamming their ideas down other people's throat because they don't believe them. Whether it's building autonomous cars, imaging the brain tissue, converting bits into atoms or atoms into bits, curing essential tremors with wearables, or changing how human trials are conducted for cancer patients. These are all examples from our portfolio companies. These people believe in a world different than the one that exists today. And they try to convince people like me that we ought to believe in them and give them the resources to keep marching forward. Their work is usually at the intersection of multiple disciplines. Teams are unusually smart and diverse. Their focus is always on the next milestone that they need to conquer rather than accomplishments of the past. You will notice that with entrepreneurs. They won't tell you what award they got last week. They will always tell you what the next milestone is that they need to hit in their business. As someone who's privileged to hang around with such folk, I have to say, they do not take any successes for granted. They know, they understand, that there are a million ways in which they may fail, but they also know that they only have to find that one way that might actually work. So at Lux, we say that the future is here, is just unevenly distributed. The rebels know things that others don't. Sometimes it's an object, a technology, sometimes it's an idea, but there's a tremendous power in knowing something and being privy to a secret that other people do not have. They learn the current set of stuff that's known, right? They, they learn the sciences, they go through schools like you all. Then they plot of how to overthrow it. They spend half of their life learning the science and the scientific rules and the other half disproving them. They learned that at one time, and why not, by the way? That makes all the sense in the world. 
Here's some examples. They learned that at one time, astronomers thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Then they learned that the sun was. And eventually, they learned that the well, universe may not have a center at all. Okay? They learned that before 1905, physicists thought space and time were absolute. But by 1930, it was very clear that they were relative. They learned that before 1960, geologists thought that the position of the continents was fixed. But by 1970, just a decade later, it was clear that the continents were attached to tectonic plates, and they moved relative to each other. Well, children are born, uh, natural-born scientists. Right? Uh, curious about everything. We've got a lot of young kids in the Lux family. We're at that age where all of my partners are having kids, right? And we keep asking this why, nagging why questions, right? Why this? Why that? And we hope they never stop. Most children's curiosity wanes by teenage years, which most of you are in or recently passed, okay? Uh, by adulthood, our curiosity wanes even more. People kind of know what they need to know to get around with their daily life often directing attention to trivial matters, like sports and entertainment news, gossip, dysfunctional celebrity lives, right? Uh, it, it is what Oscar Wilde once described as an insatiable curiosity to know everything except what is worth knowing. We believe everyone is born creative. Everyone is given a box of crayons in our lives. All of you must have had a box of crayons at some point or time, maybe in kindergarten. Right? And when inventors and entrepreneurs get inspiration at a later stage in life, it's their childhood-like voice saying from the inside, I would like my crayons back. Right? If childhood is defined as the age of play, some children are never young and some adults are never old. Let me give you some examples of game changers, individuals who believe that the world should be better and who are making their dreams come true today. This is Will, Chris, and Robbie. They were NASA scientists who dreamt of a world where the satellites do not cost $300 million to make and another $300 million to put them into the atmosphere. Well, they started Planet Labs, today called Planet, one of our portfolio companies worth over $2 billion. Um, as of last week, they have the largest constellation of satellites in space, and their microsatellites cost four orders of magnitude less than an average satellite, four orders of magnitude less, right? They have the unique capability that human beings have never had before of imaging the entire Earth once every single day. Your Google Maps will get updated every day. You paint your outside wall red, tomorrow it'll show up on Google Maps as red, okay? Uh, and by the way, these eyes in the sky that they created are being used to track refugee crises in the Middle East, you know, uh, wildebeest in Africa, in uh, sub-Saharan desertification that's going on, but also oil and gas commodities, uh, crops and agriculture in the Midwest, uh, as well as lots of other indices that are being used in financial sector. Okay? This is Helen local Boston hero in my mind, an MIT alum who fell in love with R2-D2 at a very early age as a kid. And she wanted to do nothing more than build the most amazing robots. And that's what she did. It took her more than a decade, but ultimately she built iRobot, a company that built robots that saves lives of hundreds of soldiers in the field, as well as robots that clean your home. Okay, now she's the founder and uh, CEO uh, of Sci-Fi Works, which builds gravity-defying gravity drones uh, that are, again, saving lives. They're drones built by Sci-Fi that are in military theater in Iraq today, saving lives, bringing efficiencies to commercial sector for other applications, and doing drone deliveries, recently partnered up with UPS to do that. It was a simple dream of a simple person at a very early age who then said, I'm going to make it happen. Why not? She started a drone company in 2009 that I was fortunate enough to invest in. This is before any of you or anybody anywhere had really heard of drones outside of those that are bombing in other parts of the world. She built a drone that could fly indoors and do funky things with it. This is Harvey. As a pediatrician, he changed the world upside down. He literally uh, made the pediatricians go bonkers <laughs> 15 years ago when he started talking about the fourth trimester for pregnant women. Now, women still give birth in three trimesters. But the idea was that the babies come out one trimester too early. 
These babies, to relax, need to feel the same environment that exists inside a mother's womb. So if you want a baby to relax, you don't leave them on a flat bed in a very quiet room. You make them tightly cuddled up, you, you roll up their legs close to each other, you create noise, and you rock them, okay? It was called the 5S technique. He was the author of The Happiest Baby on the Block and then Happiest Toddler on the Block. He was ridiculed by scientists early on, pediatricians early on. But now he is the number one pediatrician, most well-known pediatrician in America. Okay. Last year, Lux backed him to bring to this world a crib that does what? That puts your babies to sleep. No, I'm not joking. He's partnered with an MIT professor and, uh, and Eve Behar, a very well-known scientist and, and designer, sorry, uh, to, to build this thing called Snoo. And it's a crib that literally puts your babies to sleep in under 30 seconds, okay? Um, the product launched last year and they're already being used in almost every state in the US and many countries abroad. If you don't believe me, check out happiestbaby.com. Well, so at this point, you might be wondering, you know, how does Lux find these incredible ideas, these incredible people? Like, do we have an ability to predict the future? Is there a crystal ball we have that you don't? Not really, not really. I was just like you, I was a grad student. Shashi was smarter than me, that's how we met. Um, I often say, and I say, I really mean it, I have 0% confidence of knowing exactly what are the next big ideas I will fund over the next 12 months. But I've, I'm 100% sure that these are going to be found either next to, adjacent to, or at the edge of something that we have already funded, okay? We believe in ideas that our entrepreneurs and scientists bring to us. Let me give you some, uh, an example. Uh, several years back, our interest in a new class of materials called metamaterials led us to an investment with Bill Gates in a company called Chimera. Now, metamaterials is a class of materials that is usually used, if you go to YouTube, you will see as cloaking devices, okay? Forget about cloaking devices, they're being used as radars. There's a company in our portfolio that's using them to detect weapons and bombs on terrorists. This company, Kaimeta, decided to use that as a solid state uh, uh, antenna for satellite systems. This company is now providing that as a large backhaul internet delivery to your cars, to your uh, boats, to airplanes, etc. You know, our work with them as a satellite antenna company led us to understanding the revolution that was happening in the satellite world, which led us to investing in Planet Labs, that satellites no longer cost $300 million, but can be built for under $100,000 and launched off of a rocket in India, which, is, which was used to launch 104 satellites just last week. Okay, so we invested in, in Planet Labs. At Planet Labs, we realized that now you have an eye, or in this case, 100 satellites, looking down on Earth all the time you are generating treasure troves of data. This is an incredible amount of big data that's getting generated, right? So what do you do with that data? How do you analyze it? How do you understand that the rivers are moving distances? Or how do you understand that there are 120 oil tankers parked outside you know, Shanghai port to tell you something about the Chinese economy? Or how do you know that the China has built entire cities that there's no traffic? These are fake cities to pump up their economic numbers, but they're not real GDP growers. How do you understand that corn production is going to be poor in the country this year? How do you understand sugar crop in India is going to be pretty good, which means the sugar prices will drop, which means you might have riots in the streets? So we started investing in machine learning and AI company called Orbital Insight, which would take data from these satellites and analyze them and provide that information using the advanced deep learning tools to these companies. As we were doing that, we realized, wait a second, this machine learning and machine vision and AI is going to happen across all kinds of industries. Autonomous cars going down the road are looking at cameras and camera signals to understand in real time what is happening. Our Facebook photos, when we post them, they automatically tag us and our friends. How is that going to all happen for everybody so that you don't need to be a billion dollar company to be able to afford it? So we invested in a company called Clarify, which is democratizing machine vision and AI. You can go to Clarify today, upload a photo, and it will tell you automatically 200 things or more about your own photo. It's this kind of a place, this kind of a house, there's a woman in there, the woman's age might be this much. It's auto-tagging, it's image classification. We invested in Clarify. And as we were doing that, we realized, oh wait, this requires quite a bit of computation. This computation happens on GPU-type clusters. These GPU clusters are no longer, av are not available as yet 
on the cloud, because all the cloud infrastructure at Amazon today is not built for GPU compute. So we invested in a company called Nirvana, which was going to provide that, and that company within a year was acquired for $400 million by Intel. This was a story I just told you of us starting down a journey less than three, four, five years ago, leading up to many great companies in many different sectors, material science to space, to then machine learning AI, to then democratization of imaging and comp computational imaging, to then semiconductors. There is a thread through this, and our job as investors is to pull on these threads. Um, our inventors and our scientific entrepreneurs question everything, everything. And they ask all kinds of questions. Why do cars need a driver, right? Why don't we have electric planes? Why can't drones deliver at home? Why can't I see the world exactly as somebody else who might be in another part of the world? What if young blood in old people helped treat aging? Right? What if our machines learned the way babies do? What if, why are tattoos still applied the way they were applied a thousand years ago? Why can't we speak to our pets? Or our pets speak to us? Have you ever thought about that? Dogs speak to each other. Why can't we translate what they're saying into things that we can understand? And so on and so forth. Many, many questions. Many of us never come up with big, important, contrarian ideas. Right? We don't have world-changing ideas. But we all have a role to play as consumers of other people's ideas. New ideas may be abundant. When we encounter one, we have a choice. Right? Our choice is, do we embrace it or do we reject it? Too often, the conservative, old-fashioned, resistant to change people will come up with the saying, this will never work. This is crazy. This will never work. We will never have a drone that will carry us from Northeastern University to MIT in under a minute. It will never work. Our job is to find those who seek to ask those questions and not say, why not? But we have to find the question and answer we have to ask the question and answer what if it does. Thank you.